David Attenborough has traveled the globe countless times to film the living world in all its wonder. Aha. In a career that spans the age of television itself, he has pioneered new filming technologies, produced some of the most iconic moments in broadcasting, and inspired a generation. The Blue Whale! Now, in his 80s, he's on the road again, traveling across continents and oceans to shoot the latest installment in his epic account of life on Earth. This is a film about the life and evolution of a very rare species, caught on camera in his natural habitat. <laughs> David is making an extraordinary journey around the world to film his latest landmark series, The Story of the Origin of Life. David Attenborough's first life is the series that will fulfill his ambition to document and film all the stages of life on Earth. For the last 30 odd years I've been filming uh, the range and variety of, of animals and plants that live on the world today. But what has been missing uh, is the very beginning of the story. We've always started at chapter two. And so I just want to go back and show where this whole thing started. When I was a boy, um, that was regarded as totally unknown. There was no evidence of what, how life started. And today, there's evidence. The first piece of evidence was unearthed just 100 miles north of David's London home. This is the Charnwood Forest in Leicestershire. As a schoolboy, I grew up near here. This was where, in the 1930s, David first developed a passion for the natural world and fossils. This is the beginning of the journey for David. This is where, as a, a young boy, he looked and found fossils that got him fired up, and it really started his career. What is it, 70 odd years since David was walking these woods and cycling around them, and now we're back here. When I was a boy uh, in growing up in the Midlands in Leicester, the rocks and limestones you found in the, in the east of the country were full of the most magical things. You hit a stone and it suddenly fell open, and there was this amazing coil shell, beautiful and extraordinary. And nobody had seen that for 150 million years except you. So I thought it was very romantic and exciting, and it appealed to the small boy's instinct of collecting things. <laughs> to be honest, I don't think I've really lost. But anyway, I certainly had it then. I was a passionate fossil collector, but I never came to look for them in this part of Charnwood. And then a boy from my very own school, just a few years after I left it, made an astounding discovery. I can't remember when I heard about the discovery of China, but I certainly kicked myself. And I thought, I could have been part of history. I could have discovered that. You know, why didn't I bother to look? And this is it. It's called, and is known around the world, as Charnia, after the forest in which it was discovered. David is as passionate about fossils today as he was as a boy, an interest that was nurtured by his academic parents. He was the middle of three sons, born to Mary and Frederick. The family lived in a house in the grounds of what is now Leicester University, just half a mile down the road from the museum where he's filming now. Yes, there we are. That was university, well it was, as the press were quick to point out, uh, a lunatic asylum. And it was taken over by the university college, you see. And we lived in that which was the superintendent's house, which is college house. Then there's the big park, the Victoria Park. And there's my father. He was principal of the University College in the 1930s, and there he is, looking younger than me. Though he didn't have any hair, but not since he was about 28, I think. <laughs> David has two brothers, John and Richard, 
with Richard growing up to become an actor and Oscar-winning director. So what was the inspiration that drove the boys to such success? Perhaps it was their sense of adventure, as they explored the building that was once a psychiatric hospital. There were great areas of it that were still in the condition of them being a Victorian lunatic asylum, and that included uh, padded cells. We, as boys, used to wander around there, getting in in various ways, uh, which I suppose we shouldn't have done. And my elder brother, Richard, took me into, into this padded cell and shut the door. And that was horrible, because the inside is all, was all quilted. And where the door shut, there was no handle on the door. So you couldn't, you couldn't even see where the door was. And you knew that you could scream to your heart's content, or as loud as you wished, and nobody could possibly hear you. And that was not a pleasant sensation. I must remind him of it sometime. <laughs> David went to Cambridge to read natural sciences, and that enabled him to indulge his growing fascination with the natural world. It's a passion that still drives him on today. David's journey to discover the origins of all life is going to take him around the entire planet, encompassing four different continents and 40,000 miles. First stop, Morocco in North Africa. We're here for trilobites. Trilobites are the most um, extraordinary, wonderful uh, fossils. Here are some of them. Hummies, wonderfully prepared specimens. Happily and very, very fortunately, uh, the world's greatest expert on trilobites, or certainly one of the first three, uh, Richard Forty, an old friend of mine, uh, is here to show us round. So we should be in for a very privileged time. I think they're just about as good as you can get with, uh, with preparation. They look stunning. Trilobites are principal characters in the story of the first life on Earth. They were one of the most successful kinds of animal in history. There are 50,000 species that we know of, and probably many more undiscovered. They were the first animals to see a fully formed picture, using lenses in their eyes made of rock. And in their heyday, they dominated the globe for 250 million years. Humans have been around for just two. What is that ridge there? That is rock still in. That is the system we use. He, was, he very carefully left these for us yeah. to see the process in development, you see. You're an artist. Thanks very much. You really are. Thank you very, very much. Before filming begins tomorrow, David has a chance to pick out the best specimens for the program. He's also on the lookout for a few pieces to add to his private collection. What sort of price I, are we thinking? I, I have reserved all for a long time for you. Uh, more, than, more than three months. Thank you again very much. You are welcome. Every time, no problem. Thank you. I was Mr. Moneybags, I would have bought the Olivician ones, the new ones, on the spot. I mean, which was the one that really blew you away, David? Was it, was it, was it that, was oh, that was 15... 15k. Uh, the fossils David has just seen are the best there are. But other trilobites are widely prepared and sold in the towns and villages of this part of Morocco. But to an expert eye, there's something about some of these fossils that doesn't quite add up. But it's a nice little specimen. Well, I've never seen a trident bearer no. with a great long flared medium's prong on its trident. So either it's tr true, in which case it's weird, or it's been, let's say, nature has been helped along a little bit. If it's fake, it's carefully done. I've seen lots of different ones in my time, but I've never seen that before. Well, maybe it's pathological. 
Uh, a diseased trilobite. We don't want none of them. <laughs> Not around these parts. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want anybody catching it, is it? Aha. Thank you. Thank you. Just this one. This one I like, but it's uh, too much. Give me 1,000 dirham. It's a good price. Well. It's a good price. Seven, seven fifty. No, one thousand. Eight hundred. Hmm? Eight hundred. Ninety. Eight fifty. <laughs> Ninety dirham. No, eight fifty. Huh? Eight. Ninety. Ninety. It's very sad. I just want to murder him. Okay. How much? Okay, okay. Okay. Yes. Say Eight, eight, eight fifty. Yeah, Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> At 850 Moroccan dirham, David's got a bargain. That's roughly 70 pounds. 20, 200, 400, 600, 850. You need yes, sir. With the shopping spree over, work begins. David is filming at a local museum where there's a collection of some of the strangest and largest trilobites in existence. Action. The shape of these eyes can in themselves tell us a great deal about the way the animal lived. Some of these, are, you know, we're talking, we're talking thousands of pounds of some of these things. I mean, if not tens of thousands of pounds of something that's completely unknown to science and spectacular to boot. Well, there is a sort of a, a sort of standard rule amongst this that when you see a really lovely thing um, and you are silly enough to say that's a really lovely thing, um, the person concerned said, "Ah, of course, private collection." I have some for sale, but that one is my collection. Uh, I think probably every time you ask whether it's a private collection or not, it goes up by another multiple. <laughs> That one is my collection. <laughs> my collection yeah. Well, we've got other ones curled up with, with the eyebrows. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, a, a beautifully prepared of that. Nice food. <laughs> What's up with my leader? <laughs> okay, when I, when I show it to you, I can tell you. <laughs> David Attenborough is a name that is synonymous with television. First Life will be his 50th series as a presenter. But surprising as it seems, his long career in TV began quite by chance. And I saw uh, an advertisement in the Times for a sound radio job, which I applied for uh, and didn't even get an interview. But some um, week or so afterwards, I got a letter from someone who said they got this new thing called television. Uh, would I interest it? And then they said they'd pay me a thousand pounds to go on the training course. And that was three times what I was being paid at the time in the publishers. So I thought, well, give it a go. Television in the 50s was brand new, with the BBC providing the first public service programmes in Europe. David had never seen a television programme before, but nevertheless began work as a trainee at Alexandra Palace. I was uh, apprenticed to a, a producer who was regarded as a very experienced man because he'd been there for three months and he'd already produced one program, you know, so uh, he knew what everything was. So I joined him and we worked on a quiz called Animal, Vegetable, Mineral. David's obsession with mysterious objects of the past was put to good use behind the scenes. Ah, lovely, <laughs> isn't it? It was his job to source artefacts to be identified by a panel of esteemed academics. And they're what uh, my Hungarian colleagues would call a pitch elbow. So what we don't tell David's academic background and his analytical mind gave him an affinity with scholars and scientists that endures to this day. I've known David for rather, rather a long time and uh, we, we certainly share certain aspects of humour. I did think that somebody should make a proper feature movie, since we've got Anthony's ears here, about trilobites called Thoracic Park. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
this horse is unfit for heavy work. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>